Obrigado a todos mais uma vez. Um, após termos <coughs> feito a nossa sessão de abertura, um, eu volto a apresentar-me. Eu sou Fernando Jorge Cardoso, faço parte do Clube de Lisboa. Um, para dar uma nota de descontração, apesar de parecer que eu estou aqui muito, mas não estou. Eu sou uma espécie de sargento ajudante para aqueles que já fizeram serviço militar em termos do Clube de Lisboa, que significa que, por exemplo, enganei-me e peço ao André Tassoni Desculpa, mas como é óbvio, nós fazemos isso em todas as conferências, nós pedimos sempre ao nosso host institution para abrir a sessão <risos> e eu, eu erradamente pedi ao nosso embaixador Francisco Seixas da Costa para iniciar a sessão, mas ele, ele dentro da sabedoria que, que contém, eh, eh, soube contornar esse aspecto, mas André, eh, eu gostava de deixar esta palavra. Um, nós vamos começar a, a nossa, um, o nosso trabalho desta manhã com uma sessão a que designamos por Guerra na Europa uh, e, e na qual um, pretendemos discutir um conjunto de aspectos que eu irei deixar aos próprios painelistas para o fazerem, uh, uh, mas para poupar a nossa... Uh, um, nós, nós pedimos a um dos nossos quatro oradores para fazer também o papel de condutor dos trabalhos, aquilo que nós chamamos moderador, mas será um moderador ativo, portanto, será um moderador com opinião. Esse moderador no primeiro painel é a nossa colega Raquel Freire, que é professora da Universidade de Coimbra, de Relações Internacionais, e fazem parte deste painel Uh, o nosso convidado Sinan Ogan, eu não sei se estarei a dizer corretamente o nome dele em turco, mas uh, uh, ele, ele fará a correção necessária. Uh, ele é várias coisas, eu uh, direi que o colocamos no programa como diretor do Centro de Estudos Económicos e de Política Externa em Istambul. Teremos connosco também uh, Rosa Balfour, Rosa Balfour é a diretora da Carnegie Europe, que é, enfim, uma instituição bastante conhecida de todos nós que trabalhamos e mesmo que não trabalhamos nestes aspectos. Vai estar connosco também em online, porque não pôde ausentar-se de Bruxelas, a Helena Lazaru, que é a coordenadora em exercício da Unidade de Política Externa dos Serviços de Pesquisa do Parlamento Europeu em Bruxelas, ela juntar-se-á a nós online. Nós temos as bios de todos os nossos oradores na página da conferência, convidamos-vos a todos para uh, olharem para essas bios, são bios que, uh, enfim, mostram que são pessoas que sabem daquilo que vão falar e eu vou poupar à Raquel a, a, a necessidade de fazer as apresentações tirando o nome das pessoas e poder entrar imediatamente no corpo da nossa discussão. Portanto, peço aos, a, a, a Raquel, a, ao Sinan e à, e à Rosa para virem para o palco, por favor. E... Retiro-me agora com a minha cábula que me esqueci de trazer no início, por isso dei o meu engano e passo a palavra e dou, portanto, o comando da sessão, então, à, à Raquel. Obrigado a todos por estarem connosco. Good morning, uh, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you and our guest speakers to this panel on uh, war in Europe and discussing also European security. Um, we are witnessing clearly the return of uh, large-scale interstate war to Europe. And this is, as our ambassador mentioned also in his Uh, in his words, this is a fundamental change to European security and its context. In fact, um, there are issues that we cannot avoid to list somehow in terms of how 
they are affecting the way we conceive European security and the readjustments and the rethinking that is needed in this regard. And if we look at European security in the post-Cold War context, what we see is that there has been an erosion of some of its main pillars. If we want to, to start with the violation of the European security, uh, European borders regime, that is a, a clear example of how this um, war since 2014 that escalated with Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February 2022 is uh, putting Uh, stress and stressing the, um, the borders regime because we are talking about territorial expansion and we are talking about the violation of uh, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of a state, in the case Ukraine. So the way Russia has been positioning itself in this context is has fundamentally changed in terms of how it has been operationalizing its foreign policy from eventually more subtle means of trying to attain its foreign policy goals to clearly a more assertive, militarized and aggressive foreign policy, as we can see in clearly in this case. Also, if we think about the arms control regimes that was negotiating the, during the Cold War period, it has been eroding along uh, the years. And uh, we, we saw recently the, the last um, uh, example with uh, Russia's suspension of the START Treaty, which was the remaining treaty um, that we had in the international um, arms control regimes in, in Europe. And also, if we think about uh, security and particularly collective security in Europe, we see that the principles that the Charter of Paris for a new Europe within the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe at that time It was still the Conference for Security and Cooperation in Europe, but this idea about indivisibility of uh, security and the elements that were contained in this fundamental document have also been clearly disrupted. And of course, this creates these uh, challenges, fundamental ch challenges for the ways we think about security and how this war has been disrupting uh, European security. And this will be um, aspects that we will be discussing in this, in this panel. And I would start by um, asking or requesting um, our guest speakers to make Uh, short introductory remarks about how they position themselves before what it is, you know, in general, uh, European security for the moment, how they assess this in face of this war, so that then we can build from that our, our conversation. And maybe we could start with uh, Elena, who is joining us online. Uh, if we are, yeah, there she is. Yes, good hello, good morning. Um, very, thank you very much for having me and for inviting me to participate in this conference. Um, it's really sad not to be able to be there in person, uh, but I am now for a few hours mentally in Lisbon. Um, I think really the introductory comments um, set the stage quite well uh, when one thinks of this conference and what it mean, what security now means and how it's changing for Europe in the context we're living. I mean, thinking about this topic, um, I think it's interesting to go back for a second. Um, security has meant different things for the European Union since its inception, but it's always underpinned uh, the reason of existence of the EU. And if we go back to its the foundation of the European Economic Community and then Uh, the history of European integration, in one form or another, security has always been there. Uh, obviously, Franco-German relations uh, early on, um, then the, the, after the end of the Cold War, um, the security of uh, the neighborhood and you know, enlargement itself was a means towards uh, also offering security, be that uh, in a sort of defense sense, but more importantly, I think in an economic and prosperity and democracy uh, from that approach. So it's always been part of what the EU does. And if one looks at 
the European Union's various strategies, there's always an element of peace and security in them, whether they be part of security and defense or foreign policy or internal. But I think what has really changed now is that uh, classic uh, security in the sense of security that is linked to defense, uh, to territorial integrity and to the ability to defend, including in the military sphere, has come back. And that's, I think, uh, is the, my first point of three, is that there's been a sea change in the way uh, security is perceived and in the way uh, European Union member states uh, perceive uh, security in their own mentality and, and worldview. And I think we can see that that has changed not only in, in the immense progress that we've seen in terms of decisions, but also implementation in the field of security and defense. Uh, we've also uh, seen it in the uh, changes in individual member states with regard to their posturing. Uh, we've had Finland and Sweden apply for NATO membership. We've had Denmark hold uh, a referendum to opt into security and defense policy, announcements of increases in budget spending for defense across member states, which uh, if the European Defense Agency is correct, will perhaps for uh, the first time, the totality of, of budget spent on defense among EU member states will surpass 2%. So, so that in itself... Um, I think reflects the mentality change, but also I would add to this mentality point, um, the way enlargement uh, has suddenly featured again on the agenda, not only as an item of economic interlinkage and expanding the European market and obviously the, the freedoms, the, the four freedoms, but also as, an, as a way to anchor states into a security environment. And, and so really, I think the mentality change is the first point that comes to my mind. The second, um, I would uh, I would sort of frame as a change in the way um, security is addressed, uh, and and here I, I I mean essentially four things. One is the toolkit for security that the EU uses. Um, obviously, all policies seem to now be underpinned by an element of security, whether that be trade um, or enlargement, as I've said, but also sanctions policy, which is linked to financial issues, energy, everything is about security. Uh, and that's really been put on the map uh, with, with, with the war. Uh, but then also as part of this um, general uh, shift in decision making, I would also add the speed of decision making. Uh, I mean, we've seen unprecedentedly for European EU standards, decisions being made on the imposition of sanctions, on enlargement, uh, processes or rather candidacy uh, application and, and approval, um, very, very unprecedented ways in which the EU has decided to top up financial instruments, be they on or to move money around in its budget. Uh, peace facility, I think, has been mentioned uh, uh, or implied by the previous speaker from the Maritime Security Agency, topping up an off-budget financial instrument to almost double its size in a matter of a few months is something we have not really seen before in the EU. And, and at the same time, the move of macro-financial assistance and support to Ukraine from other parts of financing. So the speed's really different. Um, and, and then um, I think as part, again, of this sort of changing in the tools and the ways, I also think engagement uh, with third countries and other partners has also changed. Um, it's nuanced. Maybe we don't see it from the outside because the EU has always spoken of multilateralism and partnerships. But if one looks at the way the Commission is engaging and, and even leaders of member states are engaging uh, with um, uh, countries in Africa, in Asia, with the United States themselves, obviously as a key partner in this, but obviously with Ukraine uh, first and foremost. So I think all of that is in the spirit of changing security understandings. And then and then finally, and, and I think that's my third uh, takeaway from, from observing how European security is changing, I think um, the link between foreign policy and security policy is now al almost inextricable. So uh, this also leads back to the partnership question, but uh, in the engagement, and I think we're going to talk about this later on, uh, if one looks at the engagement with Latin America, for example, it may be on raw materials and energy, but it actually underpins the idea of of independence and, and a relative degree of autonomy from Russia. So it is about security. Or when one looks at the engagement with the African Union, this also bring, is very much about security as well. Uh, and, and obviously all the questions about the Indo-Pacific. So I really think that it's become, we've come to a stage where the discussions we had before the war about strategic autonomy, 
together with the implications of the war for security have meant that foreign policy is now all, in every act, every move we see underpinned by the security consideration. Uh, and perhaps that's a mentality shift for the EU itself, because it's not just about promoting global prosperity and exporting EU values, but also about securing the union itself. So this is my first sort of uh, group of thoughts. Thanks so much, Elena, for, for these. I think uh, in a nutshell, mentality, speed and tools in terms of the changes these um, have been showing in terms of European security might be a good summary for these very nice uh, initial remarks. We will get back to some of the issues that you introduced um, in our conversation. So maybe, Rosa, if I could give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be at this conference and to hear so many diverse views on the security situation, the global security situation. I think my um, I'm going to some many of the things I'm going to say are going to mirror or or add to what um, Elena has already put out. But perhaps my heading is that the theatre of war is certainly in Europe. But this war is also the epicenter of a global transformation that is broader than Europe. And it's a global transformation that is in the making, so we don't really know the direction of travel and, and where we're going. Um, and um, I think the question is, to what extent is Europe going to be shaping this through its response and through preparing for future-oriented um, policies and or, conversely, to what extent is it going to be shaped by these events? And I think that's probably the big question for European leaders at the moment. Um, I'm going to take sort of two levels of analysis. The first is the European one. And um, uh, and just perhaps share with you the debate in Europe, which is a little bit self in Brussels, which is a little bit self-referential. It's very much on assessing the type of response um, that uh, European Union institutions in particular, but I would say European states more generally beyond the European Union, um, have um, adopted to the war, but also I would add to the COVID pandemic, because with the two we have seen, we have seen an ability of uh, states and institutions to develop whole of government approaches and system based approaches that are able to look at, as Elena was saying, security policy, foreign policy, but also financing these energy diversification uh, humanitarian support, financial support for Ukraine. Um, they have managed to combine them all um, in, in what amounts amount to whole of government responses. And um, this has been quite significant. And I think the reason for which the debate in Brussels is a little bit self-referential is that uh, I think the policymakers are pleasantly surprised that actually um, this response came about quite so quickly in quite so uh, such a coordinated manner and that one year into the year into the war this response is holding up um, so that's the first point um, the second point is um, again going back also to what you were saying Raquel in introducing this session and what Elena was saying um, you know there's several strands several um, pillars around which um, Europe European states and uh, institutions are preparing themselves. And one is, of course, NATO, NATO enlargement. Uh, the other is the degree to which the EU has beefed up its uh, security responses. Um, and here I refer to what Elena was saying earlier. Um, the fact that the enlargement track has been put into motion, um, still to be seen how that's going to develop, but it's, I think, of huge historic uh, significance. Um, the fact that the transatlantic relationship has been reactivated um, at this point in time um, in a very coordinated way. We see that, you know, there's the, the, the EU and, and, and the US, despite, you know, moments in, of, you know, quarrelsome moments, for instance, over the Inflation Reduction Act. But overall, especially with respect to the war, are pretty much in lockstep. Um, and we see um, the debate about Europe's strategic autonomy shifting and changing, and maybe we can talk uh, more about that. Um, there's one additional point I'd like to make with respect to Europe, and that is that the goal of 
um, uh, steering, um, addressing uh, the climate crisis and um, doubling down on um, a green transition, a green and digital transition, have not been uh, lost in, in translation, both with, with respect to COVID in the sense that the financial resources earmarked to support the green and digital tran um, transition have not been sacrificed on the altar of um, health and ditto with the war. Um, and I think this is very important. Um, and it's also important with respect to the second level of analysis that I'd like to bring in. And that is the more global uh, perspective. And it's quite ironic in a way. I mean, whenever people like myself, Sinand, and, and the whole sort of, you know, European policy, foreign and security policy community is mobilized to address, you know, what is the next strategy or the EU's global strategy back in 2015, 2016, or Europe's security st strategy before then. There's always a debate as to whether Europe should focus, the EU should focus more on its wider region or whether it should focus more on, on the global. There's always this debate, which is a bit of a, in a way, I don't think it's a very clever way of framing things. Should it be regional or should it be um, global? And the answer is, of course, it has to be both. And I think today that debate is coming back again. The answer will continue to be, of course, it has to be both. But actually, there's very little reflection on how one interfaces with the other and what the interconnections are. And I think, you know, that at the same time, it's going to be harder for European leaders to keep those connections because the longer the war lasts, the more it's going to cost for Europeans, both financially, but also in terms of in moral and human and um, um, uh, in terms of resilience. Um, but all the more important is it to connect with the rest of the world. And I think what's been happening at the United Nations is just in a nutshell illustrates that. You know, we've had a week ago, I think, uh, another, emergent, another vote, emergency uh, resolution at the UN uh, General Assembly, which got 143 uh, states to vote. That's two more compared to a year ago. Um, again, with respect to Ukraine and Russia's war of aggression there. Um, and uh, a lot of countries in, 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 in the rest of the world are actually sitting on the fence and don't see this war as um, in, the same, uh, in, the same, um, in the same way as Europeans uh, see the war um, and are less attached to the principle of... They're not less attached to the principle of sovereignty, but they're not buying into the narrative that this is a major... Um, uh, um, uh, as you said earlier, it, this is a major infringement of the principle of sovereignty, um, which has global implications. That narrative is evidently not persuasive enough. Uh, but also, uh, the rest of the world has different relations with Russia, with China, um, and views the West more generally, it's not just Europe, in, 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 um, with criticism. Um, and I guess the most important criticism that we're hearing is that of hypocrisy um, and of double standards. And this is where the climate piece comes in again. If, for instance, if Europe wants to remain, be and remain a leader on climate crisis, then it needs to engage with countries around the globe and support these countries to address um, the, not just the impact of the climate crisis, which in some parts of the world um, is even more violent and destructive than it is um, in Europe, but also to, so not just, you know, cl climate mitigation, uh, but also um, climate adaptation and to find sort of broader coalitions that can lead that, that can lead that. Um, whereas the EU is in particular, um, and the US in particular, when viewed from other parts of the globe, are viewed as unilateral actors, as non-inclusive actors, as not multilateralist, act, multilateralist actors, and as actors that are actually um, using that language only when it suits their purposes. So, you know, we have these two debates, one in Europe and one which is a bit more global. And I think finding the connection between the two um, is the key um, for policies in the future. So again, to go back to the title, which is you know about security in Europe, and the title of the session, this is Europe War in Europe. Yes, the theater of war is in Europe, but the issues are much more global, and you know I think it's important to look at them through this double lens. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Thanks, Rosa, for for this very nice introduction and this um, uh, interlinkage that we clearly need to think about the, what is happening in Europe and a bit further than this. And this West and the rest is for sure something we will get back to in, in our conversation. Also very interesting the way other issues are still on the agenda and they are so fundamentally important there, like the climate agenda, uh, for sure. Uh, Sinan, please, can you share with us? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Raquel. Um, I come from Turkey, but my birthplace is Lisbon, so I never miss an opportunity to come back here, and therefore I would really like to thank the organizers, uh, the Club of Lisbon, for extending an invitation to me. Um, I'm going to talk about two broad themes. The first broad theme is what has changed for Europe. And the second broad theme is what are now the big questions facing Europe related to the war. But if the moderator would kindly allow me, I want to start with a mini poll of the audience. And I have two questions for you that will sort of guide also my intervention. I want to take you back on the 23rd of February 2022. Forget what has happened since then. How many of you really, really believed that Russia was going to attack? Show of hands. So I gather that the rest of you didn't really believe that Russia was going to attack. Point number one. Question number two, therefore. How many of you, with the experience that we had since a year, really believe that as of the 24th of February 2022 until now, both Europe, but more broadly, the transatlantic community would demonstrate the sense of unity that it has? Did you believe that this was going to happen the way it happened? Or would you, did you believe that we would be split like we were in before in Iraq and Crimea? So even there. And I think that's what Putin counted on. That yet one more time, Europe would be split. That the Americans and the Europeans you know, would not be on the same page. And therefore what happened in 2008 in Georgia, 2014 in Crimea would repeat itself. That the reaction from the West would be weak. That he would essentially be allowed to swallow part of Ukraine without the complications that he faces today. So these two questions bring me to my main thematic lines. The reason why there has been so much unity on the transatlantic side has to do, even though I speak in a European capital, I think Mr. Chairman already said that the US was a European power. It has to do with the type of diplomacy we've seen from the White House. Yeah. The type of diplomacy that you know was very different compared to past international crisis. So that U.S. leadership, to me, was instrumental in bringing about the type of united response to this aggression, to this war. United response on the side of the security challenges, when you look at what happened on NATO. United response on the side of sanctions, uh, which created a very different world. So the first question, therefore, facing Europe, which was already existing, but I think it put even more in the forefront, is the future of the relationship with the US. Mm -hmm. And now we have a, you know, a White House administration that has professed interest in multilateralism, in reaching out to Europe, obviously, and they did a remarkably good job, I think, on diplomatic level. But can we really count on that from the U.S. perspective? 
Because a few years ago, we as Europeans experienced a very different US under Trump, who was belittling NATO. What, there was even discussions when you read some of the books of Trump wanting to pull out US from NATO, whether, you know, how, how seriously we should take that, whether we should take it at face value or not is another question. But that's the sort of US we're facing. Now it's a different US. But do we have a guarantee that post 2024, what will be the type of you know, relationship with regard to US and how US looks at European security? Added to that is what I've discussed until now is the partisan divide in the US. But there is also a bipartisan viewpoint in the US about China. The China question has become across the board you know, bipartisan issue for the U.S. foreign and security establishment. When you look at some of the official documents, starting with the uh, White House security strategy, which has actually also had uh, an impact on the new NATO strategic concept, you see the rise of China as a major security challenge. <coughs> so viewed from the U.S. perspective, there are many people who argue that going forward with the heavy strategic focus on China and the threat of a Taiwan-led crisis in Southeast Asia, maybe that's something that we'll talk about in the next session, that the U.S. should ask Europe to do much more about its own security. That's already been an issue in the past, but is likely to be an issue even more in the future. So the future of that security relationship with the U.S. is something that has changed with the war in Russia. And maybe, you know, it may be somewhat of an uncomfortable truth. But when you look at how the West has supported Ukraine, when you look at these graphs about who supplied the weapons to Ukraine, by far, above all the rest, it's about the U.S., Look at the debate in Germany until very recently. Germany, that heavy weight in the EU, and its resistance about you know, being uh, a major actor in this uh, support to Ukraine. So on that, you know, from that perspective, the future of the relationship with the US is one big issue. The second big issue, the second big question for Europe is the politics of security. And here I'm talking about the domestic, the social contract that we have in Europe about how we look at external security. Because obviously for long and for justifiable reasons, after 1989, we benefited from a peace dividend. That peace dividend translated itself in a perception within public opinion that allocations for security and defense could be reduced, and that money should go to other you know, uh, areas, uh, education, health, uh, whatever the social contract uh, of that country dictates. And it was very understandable. But now we have reached a point suddenly, and I think that came as a shock. You know, that's why I asked the first question, how many of you really believe that Russia was going to attack? The answer that I got from the audience is no different than the answer I get in other parts of Europe where I go and speak about the, uh, the consequences of war. But this will need to translate into a, a different sort of political contract at home about how we look at uh, the issue of uh, defense spending in Europe. Because obviously, and you know, this is perhaps nothing new, it was an inherent tension within NATO for a long number of years, the issue of burden sharing, uh, US commitment, US defense spending versus European defense spending. But now it's become much more uh, to the core about uh, what Europeans need to do in terms of uh, upgrading uh, their defense spending for the years to come. And this is definitely where there has been some movement. Uh, we've seen many countries now being committed to the 2% goal uh, in, in, uh, in, in terms of defense spending. Uh, 
uh, we've seen Germany even committing itself to an extra spending of 100 billion euros, a lot of that uh, across Europe. But the main question here is about sustainability, uh, namely for how long this commitment is going to exist. Uh, and this also ties in with the sustainability of uh, the, the political willingness to continue to help Ukraine. And this is perhaps what, you know, uh, what uh, the game plan on the side of Russia is. The fact that after some point, after many months, after a couple of years, that uh, Europe will start to say, wait a second, we don't want to spend our resources uh, towards a war that has no end. And we have to pressure Ukraine to settle on the terms that are perhaps much closer to what uh, Putin wants uh, in Ukraine. So I think that might be uh, the threat uh, facing Europe. The third point is uh, the future of the relationship, if we're gonna talk about you know, the future of security, and here I'm talking mostly about conventional security, about territorial defense. Of course, it's the relationship between NATO and the EU where we know there are, there are problems, uh, but nonetheless, at this time of acute crisis, I don't think that we can really afford a relationship that is dysfunctional. On the contrary, uh, we, we have to be smart about the role of each of these institutions in the hardcore uh, security uh, arena and try to create uh, the optimal relationship that would help us uh, in terms of preventing the, duplica the duplication of resources, of efforts uh, and assets. Another point related to that is, of course, the EU's relationship, not just with NATO, but to two, quote-unquote, peripheral countries that are military powers in Europe. One is the UK, the other one is Turkey. How do you create a future, if you're looking at the issue of security, which is, you know, indivisible, uh, how do we create a future that would allow you to leverage uh, the ability, the capacity uh, of those countries uh, as you're looking at the uh, long-term uh, security implications of Europe? And here the discussion about uh, strategic autonomy uh, are obviously instrumental. Uh, they are a pathway towards creating a, a more independent Europe that is able to ensure its own security. But I think now that these discussions on uh, strategic autonomy need to take into consideration uh, all these symptoms and observations uh, that I've tried to highlight uh, that I think we need to focus as a result of the war in Ukraine. So maybe I want to end here for my you know, first part. Thank um, you. Thanks so much for that. And indeed, you are. we are clearly touching now some of the core issues we want to discuss in this panel regarding exactly the the role and the transformation of NATO regarding this, this um, new picture that we have. Also how the EU has been adjusting, you have been giving some hints and also about transatlantic relations and how much in this reconfiguration of European security we will have uh, more dependencies or more independencies, uh, what the strategic autonomy for the EU will mean in practice, how these organizations uh, work inside and between themselves. So the old debate about NATO and the, the EU, how this, this is configuring itself and the, the, what the information we get out of this context of war is, of course, that there are um, lines of the adjustment that are becoming clear, but there are also some uh, ideas that are put there, even in paper, but we are not sure whether this will pull off at some point. So maybe, Sinam, if you wouldn't mind to keep going and get a bit more into this NATO uh, issue and because we know Turkey is also a member of NATO and how this uh, also plays out in the relationship. How do you see, uh, and you talked also about the importance of the US administration and how we can uh, keep the transatlantic relation uh, uh, going, uh, if you could address a bit more these issues, I think it would be quite uh, useful. 
So let's start with NATO. Um, of course, uh, the on the NATO side, uh, if we you know sideline the EU for a moment, um, the most important development uh, has been uh, the strategic concept. The strategic concept, as is, uh, reflects the current state of uh, the geopolitical tension. Uh, the threat landscape that is now very visible uh, on the side uh, of Europe. And uh, it paints a very different picture of Russia than the strategic concept of 10 years ago, where there was this twin track approach uh, with, you know, the possibility of engagement with Russia, the NATO-Russia Council, and so on. Today, all of that has disappeared. Today, Russia is a, a major uh, security threat uh, to Europe. Interestingly, the other big change viewed from the NATO perspective has to do with China. The way that China is being described in the NATO strategic concept has also changed over the years. And here, I think we see the influence uh, of uh, the US positioning on China, which ultimately impacted European thinking on China. Because for long, China, at least within NATO, Europeans didn't really want to talk about China. China was out there, you know, it was out of region. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, part of, uh, obviously it has no relevance to Article 5 uh, initially. So China was not really a NATO issue. Now it is a NATO issue. Uh, when you look at both, you know, how it's been uh, redacted in the NATO strategic concept, but even more so operationally when you look at, you know, what NATO discusses, what's the agenda on, on the NAC, there is discussion about China. And the reason why there is discussion about China has to do with what I tried to highlight at the beginning, the fact that as the U.S. strategic focus is shifting to Southeast Asia, NATO has also is under the uh, the obligation to adapt to this shift by the US because that strategic shift would also mean a shift of resources at some point or or the other and that will have implications about you know uh, about how uh, NATO will continue to provide uh, for the security uh, of its uh, European allies um one particular issue with NATO that Raquel has, uh, has mentioned uh, is uh, the position of Turkey as a NATO ally uh, in this war uh, with, in, in Ukraine. Um, Turkey is the only NATO member uh, that has not implemented sanctions against Russia. Now, on paper, at first, this may seem to be quite a shocking uh, stance, given that all the other NATO members as have sanctions against uh, against Russia. Now, viewed from Turkey's perspective, the motivation for having adopted this position is, I would say, threefold. The first motivation is that our geography, we may not be as blessed as Portugal, <laughs> our geography dictates that we have continued to have a functional relationship with Russia. Because in Syria, and here I would put the blame mostly on, 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 on the EU and the US to some extent, Turkey has been forced to work with Russia. That has come about as a result of the total, total lack of appetite on the side of the EU to intervene in Syria in the early part of the conflict but also the recalcitrance of the U.S. to do the same, even after the use of chemical weapons in Syria. So ultimately, Turkey had to find other ways to try to stabilize the situation in Syria. After the shock of refugees, Turkey now has about 4 million Syrian refugees, and therefore it, see, it, it feels really the shock of this chaos in Syria. And therefore, it tried to find diplomatic partners to stabilize. And it ended up with unnatural partners, which are Russia and Iran. But as unnatural as they may be, ultimately, 
it provided a solution to a stability, at least a pseudo stability in Syria. It ended the, you know, the, uh, the pressure of refugees uh, primarily. So that model of diplomatic partnership uh, with Russia is important. And this is something that you may call the tyranny of geography, but something that's been imposed on us uh, as a result of our geographical situation. Now, that modus vivendi with Russia uh, was also used in other regional crises, and here I can name Libya, but also Nagorno-Karabakh, where the two, Turkey and Russia, worked together uh, to try to find uh, at least a ceasefire and possibly a, a political settlement after that. So that's one major reason why Turkey felt that it did not have the luxury to follow European sanctions. Secondly, from a more pragmatic perspective, Turkey is a bit like the UK. It's a country that has, and also like Portugal, by the way, it is a country that has an imperial heritage. And countries with imperial heritage have a different viewpoint on how they want to practice diplomacy. On sanctions, and even though I, you know, I can sympathize with the criticism that, you know, why is it that Turkey does not apply sanctions? Well, the answer that you get in Ankara when you, you know, when you, when you pose that question is, first of all, we're not EU. So we're not bound legally by the EU sanctions. And secondly, and possibly more importantly, you cannot treat Turkey as a total third country Decide on the sanctions yourself. Don't consult Turkey on the sanctions and expect Turkey to follow your sanctions. That's not how this relationship is going to work. And I think that message needs to be heard. So if you want Turkey to be part of the sanctions regime, there needs to be ways to engage Turkey on deliberations about sanctions. You're not going to get Turkey follow the EU sanctions mm -hmm. if you decide on this without ever consulting Turkey on this. That's why, you know, that's where, that's where, where there's another political difficulty. Now, this is all about Russia. Then on NATO enlargement, here it's mostly about domestic politics, to tell you the truth. Yes, Turkey has had grievances uh, with Sweden, particularly regarding their laxity on their terror legislation, which allowed uh, a number of and mostly the PKK-related entities to operate more freely in Sweden, to do fundraising, to do recruitment, uh, and the Swedish authorities have not done enough to curtail that. So I think that part... Uh, that, you know, those grievances uh, were legitimate, are legitimate. And therefore, Turkey tried to use the strategic leverage that it has, given that all NATO countries uh, have to say yes to NATO enlargement, to put pressure on Sweden and Finland, so that these countries take Turkey's concerns more, uh, more diligently. And this is what has happened. Actually, Sweden did deliver on a number of, you know, of issues, essentially admitting that their past behavior was something uh, that could have been redressed, and it has been redressed. So going forward, uh, I, would, uh, I do expect, firstly, Turkey to green light Finland. So by the time of the na next NATO summit uh, in, uh, in Vilnius, uh, we will have at least Finland, uh, if, of course, uh, the uh, Helsinki accepts to join in a way that is not uh, together with Sweden. And with Sweden, it will ultimately depend uh, on the outcome of Turkey's elections, which will happen in two months' time. Uh, the reason why it may be more protracted with Sweden has to do with, as I said, to some extent also with domestic politics. Uh, but if there is a new government, which is a bit more likely, then that new government uh, will also have uh, a, a very different foreign policy outlook, which may not be part of this panel, uh, 
but nonetheless, it would uh, make it easier for the both countries uh, to join NATO, uh, you know, with the Vilnius summit. Um, maybe, yeah, that's what I want to say. Awesome. Do you want to add something on the transatlantic relation? And yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, the transatlantic, I agree 100% with what Sinan said about US leadership. Um, you know, for all the um, uh, the, the you know satisfaction with the way in which uh, the, the EU responded, it was very much crafted in Washington. Mm -hmm. The whole strategy um, and uh, and and you know the outcome of the next presidential elections um, in in the United States will be you know will be a sort of make or break uh, moment. Uh, I think um, in this regard, beyond, I mean, there's there's a question about the elections and where they will go. And I think there we also need to look at intra-European politics um, and the degree to which uh, Europeans have managed to bridge their divide between, shall we say, Western Europe and Central Eastern Europe and Baltic states. And I think we've seen, you know, Russia used to be the most divisive issue in European foreign policy. That is, has now been overcome, thanks to Russians, I, I, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But Europeans haven't been very successful in building upon that bridge um, and coming together uh, more firmly on, uh, you know, a strategic view for for Europe. So while they've agreed a set of policies, you know, whenever if we start talking about the where this war is going and where this war may end you suddenly see that all those divisions that existed before Russia's invasion come up again. And there hasn't been an exercise to build trust between these, compete these you know, past competing visions. And that's something that will reemerge, be it during 2023, depending on the outcome of, uh, uh, of depending on what happens um, in Ukraine and where those borders of Ukraine, where those, where the front line, where the, the, the battlefield uh, may go, uh, but also, of course, if there's a change um, um, in in the U.S. and if uh, and depending on you know which which president will be elected, of course, if we have a Trump-like president, then you we cannot count on U.S. support uh, for Ukraine. Certainly not to the degree that we've seen it so far and this is you know still a positive uh, an optimistic mm -hmm. um scenario um and that will pose major questions not just for the degree to which europeans are willing to continue with this and double down on investing both on security and defense but also you know the impact of of uh, the of, of a war economy and, and that's a you know big question mark i have no answer uh, to that um uh, but also, to what extent will they ma manage to keep that unity? Um, when Trump became president of the United States, the Polish uh, president traveled to Washington and offered, uh, you know, addition additional, uh, well, offered actually a Fort Trump, a, a U.S. base in Poland. And so there's a very strong risk of a bit of a split uh, between um, pro-NATO, Central and Eastern Europeans, and uh, um, um, and, and with with a stronger um, uh, transatlantic focus, and those who will be focused more on building Europe's capacity. And to be honest, if we look at and Elena mentioned, you know, all the policies and the decisions, it's all very remarkable, no doubt. But I think we're still talking about NATO as far as as the, the, the principal actor as far as territorial defense is concerned, the EU, you know, it would, it would involve a generational uh, policy change before the EU could have that type of capacity. Um, and I don't think the political conditions are there for this to happen. So, you know, a lot will have to take place uh, within, within the context of NATO. I think the fact that NATO is set to enlarge and, you know, there'll be more overlap between the EU and NATO with Sweden and Finland's accession um, than, than there is now. I, I think that might help bridge those gaps, but politically those gaps um, certainly do exist. Mm -hmm. The other pillar I would like to mention, if I may, is enlargement, EU enlargement. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you know, the big enlargements of the EU and NATO have happened very much in parallel um, tracks. And this may well be the case for Ukraine and Moldova as well. But I think the um, 
the um, EU dimension is not to be taken as a secondary um, impact. Of course, so long as there is a war in Ukraine, this is not going to happen. Uh, there needs to be at least uh, at least some kind of settlement on the bound on the boundary on the borders, um, for sure. But the fact that the, that EU enlargement and the accession to the EU is so transformative from the point of view of the economy of the, the, the state and it's how it's organized, of the rule of law. Um, you know, in the past, in, and the, especially I'm thinking in particular of the uh, Big Bang enlargement of 2004 that brought eight countries from Central Europe into the European Union, um, you know, that is a, a, a hugely transformative uh, project which responds to the nature of the challenge that we have. The challenge is not just a military and security one, but it's about... It's about democracy, as President Biden always underlines. Um, but it's also about preparing uh, our, our, our societies and our institutions to, you know, address the big picture challenges of the future, which are, again, you know, climate and the technological uh, revolution. So I think that um, that um, uh, sort of work in progress um, uh, chapter um, is as important as um, in the long run, of course, as uh, you know, addressing security, uh, be it through NATO, be it through the transatlantic relationship, be it through the EU. So I think we need to take that um, into account as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe Elena wants to join us with uh, commenting a bit more on the EU in the in all these processes and how you see this EU-NATO relationship eventually going? Uh, yes, yes, and I, and I, I, I would uh, indeed perhaps uh, mention j just nuance of some of the points that have already been made. But before I go into that, I just wanted to make a point as well about the United States um, and, and, and the China question in particular uh, and the generational change, the demographic change, which underpins that. And I think um, while I subscribe and I think there is a general um, lesson learned from the election of Trump and that this may well be the case that there is a, uh, a new U.S. administration that will not be um, as transatlanticist as, as what we are currently witnessing with the Biden administration, which arguably is at, at, at an, a height of relations not seen before. However, when one looks at Congress and, and public opinion in the US, I think it's important in conversations like that to say that uh, there is bipartisan support for NATO. I mean, it's over the 70% in support by Republicans. And of course, yes, we are seeing at the moment, I think, and Rosa will, will be more expert on this than I am, but a sort of transitional moment in, in, in United States politics in both parties. So the jury's out as to whether that kind of bipartisan support will remain. But at the same time, I think um, regardless of, of what the election outcome is next year, I don't think um, it's likely that such numbers uh, of, of support for NATO will suddenly collapse and flatten out. At the same time, what we're seeing, I think, is about the same uh, percentages perceiving China as a threat. So I think for the United States, it's at the moment where there is this bipartisan perception of, of China, but also bipartisan approach to the support for Ukraine uh, and, to, and to the fact that NATO is vital, perhaps even reinforced by the current situation. But again, with these kind of data, one never knows if there one trend is on the, ups, up on, the, on, the, on the growth curve, the other one is declining. So but at the moment, I think... Um, when one looks at the Republican Party, in spite of internal factions, that there is there as well the support. And I think the congressional um, reaction to the proposed budget uh, that President Biden proposed for Ukraine, which was to increase it uh, from both sides of the aisle, is indicative of that. At the moment, there is that kind of support from the United States for for this uh, security situation in Europe. At the same time, and this perhaps leads me to the points I want to make on EU and NATO, with everything we touch on in this discussion on the war in Europe, as the panel is entitled, I think it's important to always keep in mind that there is a short-term dimension and a long-term dimension of what we're observing. In the short term, um, without doubt, uh, the actors we're discussing, the EU, NATO, and I would add the G7 um, and, and other partners, 
are at the moment confronting a crisis which is here and which needs an immediate reaction. And I think that's why a lot of what we're seeing in terms of EU-NATO cooperation, in terms of collaboration and cooperation on imposing sanctions is really quick, but it's also not here. We, we, do, we do not have certainty that it's here to stay in the long run. So I think when we look at the EU-NATO relationship, which we're discussing now, we have to separate these two trends of, of what's happening now and what we expect to see in the future, including a potential shift of the United States uh, and, uh, and perhaps the United States guiding NATO to that shift towards the Indo-Pacific. Now the epicenter of the war is in Europe, but globally, yes, we have those trends. Um, on the issue of EU-NATO relations, I mean, apart from the general sort of euphoria that seems to be abounding and, and when talking about the fact that there have been third three joint declarations and finally a third one which by the way took a very long time uh, to be agreed on and that alludes to internal problems between the two organizations politically um i think i think a, perhaps the the issue of um I wouldn't call it division of labor, but of who does what in some ways, the synergy, I wouldn't call it, uh, I wouldn't call it a division of labor, but the synergies between the two have at the moment at least become a bit more clear uh, because of the war and the urgency of it. And I'll explain um, when one looks at NATO's forward presence, when one looks at how NATO has reinforced, uh, including at the end of last year, it's the multinational battle groups in the Eastern flank. When one looks at the way NATO has deployed military capabilities uh, to, 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 the, to the Eastern borders of, of the EU, I think there is no question there. And I don't think anyone is posing the question where the, that is something NATO does uh, or the EU does or, will ever or whether that will ever change. So I think forward presence, deployment, these are what, what everything that falls into this territorial defense, as Rosa said, uh, it has always been said it would remain with NATO, and I think current circumstances have shown that NATO does that, and it does it well, and and I, member states are perhaps more than ever in support of that. Um, but the the deterrence issue, and perhaps uh, should I call it, the, the way in which resilience matches deterrence, and by the way, this is very interesting, in the US national security strategy, now there is a phrase, a catchphrase, which is uh, deterrence through re resilience, and this this suggests that to avert future crises, the work is not only uh, classical uh, defense, sort of a conventional uh, defense work, but it's also about uh, cyber defense. It's also about uh, foreseeing malign interference. And I think on that, that side of things, uh, on the side of things which is about resilience and about how in the future, future crises will be averted, uh, which also has to do with the technological capabilities to control foreign influences. I think, I think on that there is actually um, there is actually uh, uh, quite a lot of space for synergies, and it's that's it's it's indicative that in this third EU uh, NATO declaration that just came out uh, recently. Um, most of it is very declaratory and symbolic, but the one point on which it's agreed that work, work will be taken further concretely is disinformation and countering foreign interference in cybersecurity. So I think the areas where that work will happen uh, jointly and where there is mutual support for cooperation is really that, that particular uh, area. And of course, um, as part of NATO, uh, the United States, but also other non-EU members of NATO are also uh, making the steps to integrate or rather to cooperate with the EU through the EU structures in that area. So we've seen the United States sign uh, this administrative arrangement with the European Defense Agency, which we have been waiting for for a long time, uh, so as to participate uh, in, in, in projects there. And then we've seen the United Kingdom uh, intending to join the military mobility PESCO project. So I think, I think on areas of capabilities, um, uh, and and it it is an area which which seems to be going ahead uh, quite uh, quite substantially. Um, of course, uh, one thing in the EU NATO relationship that seems to uh, become even more prominent as a problem to solve, uh, in, including now with the enlargement of Finland. Uh, and Sweden uh, to, or potentially to, to join uh, NATO, uh, seems to be, unfortunately, Sinan, I'll mention it here, I was hoping you will mention it, but um, 
the, the blocking of relations that persists because of the Turkish Cyprus uh, issues. And, and, and I mentioned this here, particularly because this seems to be also blocking the sharing of intelligence. And that we have seen in the war on Ukraine um, has been a substantial area in which the two organizations would in an ideal world need to speed up and to enhance cooperation, the sharing of intelligence. Um, so there are issues to be solved, but I think what, what the war on Ukraine, the, the Russia's war on Ukraine is doing is really recalibrating the relationship and really um, not just in hypothetical scenarios and, and declarations, but really practically on the ground indicating which are the areas where it's clear that NATO would have, uh, has, would have um, the leadership, but also the capability to implement. It is also indicating which are the areas where cooperation is not only possible, but is also ideal. It it would be, uh, it would add value, uh, and where the structures exist for that. And I think those areas of capabilities, but also of development of capabilities of industrial policy, of innovation and technology, are offering themselves for that. But it's also revealing the political sensitive points that need to be addressed in order for the two organizations to achieve the degree. Of, of cooperation that the declaratory nature of the agreement of the joint uh, statements suggests. Finally, on sanctions, I mean, it's been brought up um, with regard to Turkey, but I think it's important to, to say that um, sanctions have somewhat entered the, the NATO lexicon because of the war on Ukraine. And, and, and it's not necessarily something that we have associated with the NATO decision in the past. But if one looks at the first months of 2022, uh, of course, the EU being the EU uh, does adopt its sanctions through its decision-making processes in the council. And many of them also relate to EU competences. But um, it was striking how those sanctions were quickly discussed and then publicly announced as coordinated with both NATO and the G7. And, and my sense is that with the United Kingdom being both a G7 and a NATO member, that had a, a sort of implicit effect on, on, on that cooperation with the United Kingdom, which is not put on paper, but because the G7 and NATO have been so critical in working with the EU, both on sanctions, but on the coordination of deliveries as well. I think, I think that has really um, helped streamline that relationship. That's not the case, as has been said, with Turkey in the area of sanctions, but obviously Turkey is not a G7 member. But I think there is something to be said about the interplay uh, between um, between these 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 three um, uh, organizations, where I think a lot of the coordination uh, took place. Looking forward, and this is really a final word. I just to focus for a second just on EU defense policy. As I said in the beginning, I think. Uh, the war has pushed forward uh, the decisions about what it will look like in the coming years. Um, and as I said before, with the commitments on the table by 2025, the EU as a whole intends to surpass the 2% of spending. Um, there is on the table, there are on the table proposals for joint procurement, smaller scale to begin with, but joint investment in a bigger investment program later on. Um, there are the initiatives for sending weapons together under the peace facility. And as of next week, there'll be a discussion about joining forces to send ammunition. But at the same time, I think it's also important to say that going back to the short-term, long-term discussion, it is clear that at the moment, the war has made clear that the EU does not have at the moment the stockpiles uh, and, and, and the... Um, uh, correctly, uh, readily available and maintained capabilities. So, so I think in the short term, it has raised the concerns, but uh, we should keep in mind that the plans for the development of the EU security and defense policy that we see on paper now, those will materialize in, in a decade, essentially. And I think it's that decade that represents what the, the, the long-term version of what we should be looking at. What will the US be looking at in a decade? Will it be China? Will the US... Uh, pass that message of China being an integral part of security and defense through NATO as well. We saw it in the Madrid uh, Madrid um, strategic concept that China is for the first time in that NATO uh, list of, of threats. 
And by then, what will EU security and defense policy be able to do? And I think that's for the future, but it does have to do with realizations that came from the war on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Elena, for bringing in these remarks that really complement well the conversation we were having. Um, I'm switching to Portuguese now. Vamos abrir o espaço para discussão. Temos vários assuntos em cima da mesa que, que os, nossos, os nossos convidados uh, trouxeram. Muito interessante alguma, uh, algumas palavras em termos de, do cuidado, como devemos olhar para algumas destas questões, incluindo uh, dinâmicas uh, de aproximação que parecem estar em aceleração, mas que serão também em algum momento confrontadas novamente com velhas uh, dinâmicas de competição, processos de competição interna na própria União Europeia, na, na, entre os próprios membros da NATO e, portanto, algum cuidado na forma como uh, avaliamos e analisamos os impactos da, desta guerra naquilo que são uh, as relações atuais e de mais curto prazo e aquilo que será no longo prazo esta, esta eventual arquitetura de segurança europeia. Mas vamos abrir até por uma questão de tempo, estamos um bocadinho uh, apertados de tempo, uh, a questões da audiência e portanto pedi a quem... Uh, Talvez possamos coletar duas ou três questões, voltamos ao painel e eventualmente depois fazermos uma segunda ronda. Vou pedir para que haja contenção e objetividade. Ok, thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, um, in my question, I want to go back to the phrase used by Ambassador Francisco da Costa in his opening remarks. That phrase was um, describing the United States as an indispensable nation. And uh, I would like to ask the panel whether the recent war, whether the Russian aggression in Ukraine and the measures that the United States has done, has taken sanctions, the withdrawal from the WTO's uh, arbitration process, the institution of policies that prevent the free flow of resources in specific sectors, semiconductors, for security and political reasons, means that this phrase has to be re-understood. And one specific aspect of this phrase, which I should mention to you, is that I come from Asia. In Asia, we had a very much uh, strong benefits from globalization. Uh, and the United States has been the chief architect of the globalization from which Asian countries and low-income countries across the world have benefited. Um, it has also been the chief enforcer. Today, it seems to be the chief spoiler. So from these dimensions, economic, political, security, do you f does the panel feel that we can, when we use the term in indispensable nation to describe the US, we must now reinterpret it in a different way? Thank you. Obrigada. Temos aqui, temos, sim, esse senhor, por favor, e depois aqui à frente. Uh, good morning. My name is José Alberto Pereira. I come from Hero Defense Portugal. Uh, I have two small, uh, two small questions. The first is um, uh, we, have to, we have to recognize that uh, Ukraine is in Europe, the war is in Europe. Ukraine is running for be a NATO partner, but also to be a European Union partner. However, um, uh, European Union has, uh, has a, uh, a follower position all on all this process, in spite, despite uh, that has been in March 2022 been approved to be implemented a document called Strategic Compass. The Strategic Compass now is more or less like a dead document. Uh, in the other hand, uh, right-wing uh, movements and parties are growing all over Europe. So uh, I would like a brief appointment. Uh, Eight million, eight million Ukrainian refugees are entering in the center and uh, uh, East Europe countries. So I would like a brief appointment of views about the reactions of these countries when 
Europeans will have to pay a part or whole the the bill of reconstruction Ukraine and how will it change geo geopolitical in Europe. Second question, just two brief questions. We are for a long time believing that Mr. Recep Erdogan will allow Sweden and uh, Finland to enter in NATO. However, this is due to the voting procedure on, on NATO. How is the probability that if Mr. Erdogan will allow that, that will be a copycat called Victor um, uh, the guy from Hungary, Ur Victor Urban. Orban. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Obrigada. Temos aqui mais uma questão uh, aqui à frente. Uh, thank you. Uh, this again, Naidu, and I want to add an African voice to this. Uh, I hear what you're saying, and Rosa, you're right that this is not just a European war, but it's the epicenter not only for global change, but perhaps a global conflict as well. And there's a rather old African proverb that says that when elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And Africa certainly considers it part, itself part of that savanna. Uh, so it would be useful for you to offer some commentary around what this means beyond Europe, and in particular, the developing world. In particular, in the context of, instead of a wooing stance from the northern powers, it's become rather a threatening stance around the non-aligned uh, positions that several countries are taking in the south. That's one. The, the second one is that, what does this really mean for the momentum of the climate change response agenda? So in the short term, what has happened with the Ukraine war is a very quick backtrack of what has been happening in the COP discussions and the commitments around mitigation and the carbon targets. Do you see this as temporary or does this have implications for a much longer term? Because it has caused huge confusion globally around the momentum, around the meaning of commitment and may well organize for a much lower momentum around moving to a low carbon transition. Thank you. Obrigada. Pergunto se há mais alguma questão, porque temos questões com várias questões dentro. Vamos então passar ao, ao painel. Um, any of you would like to start? Uh, quem gostaria de começar? Ah, mais uma questão? Então, fecha sim, fechamos com mais essa questão e depois passamos aqui as palavras aos convidados. De uma forma breve, gostaria apenas de dizer que dizer, esta discussão é muito rica, é um magma com muitas implicações, mas centrando-me no tema, no tema do painel neste momento, eh, estamos centrados na Europa e na guerra na Ucrânia, eh, devemos distinguir entre o short term, the short term and long term. And, uh, About that, you have to say that uh, uh, you are within our yard, but uh, uh, beyond our reach. That is to say, many of the problems that we are facing now are passing in Europe, but uh, they are linked with uh, the global world. And uh, not to have consideration is to have a kind of a, a Ptolemaic view and not a Copernican one. What I can uh, say is that uh, we're talking about NATO enlargement and the relation between NATO and the EU. I think it's very crucial, it's very important, it gains momentum, but you have to think about uh, another thing. I mean, geography is always there. Geography is something that is not lying at all. Uh, you have at some point, maybe in a medium period, you have to think on not just uh, in NATO enlargement, relations between Europe and the United States, and so on and so on. But you have to think that at some point, you have to revisit the OCC business as well. Because, I mean, in the long and long past, if you want to go into a world that is balanced between interests and values, you have to touch that score again with a new light. But I think it will be very important. Thank you. <laughs> 
Obrigada. Vou então passar a palavra rapidamente um, aos nossos oradores. Maybe Sim, yeah, I can, start, I, if I'm uh, allowed. I'll start by actually merging a couple of questions and give you a broader answer. The questions that I want to answer is uh, the issue about whether the U.S. is the inevitable power, linking to your question about Europe and the global south, and the last question about the you know OECE as a, as a platform. I think when I heard the chairman speak about the U.S., it was mostly in the context of security, where the U.S. will remain a you know unavoidable uh, partner uh, and inevitable and, and a European power. But your question to me is actually symbolizes another discussion which is very topical, very relevant, and very important, which is how do we make sure that, at least from the part of the geographic West, the commitment to the multilateral order, and these countries see themselves as champions of the multilateral order, how does this commitment remains compatible with many of the initiatives, some of them that you rightly elaborated on, but there are some on the European side as well, and CBAM is, I think, one of them, about the reaction to the geopolitical shocks, the threat on, you know, on globalization, re, you know, nearshoring, friendshoring, all of that how do they how do we make this compatible with a commitment to the multilateral order that is the uncomfortable question that we need to ask because indeed what we are seeing increasingly through these initiatives inflation reduction act the dismantling of the wto panel process uh, chips act cbam i would argue all of them are essentially inimical to what we view as the international rules-based multilateral trading regime. They, they're difficult to make them compatible. So at which point do we need to stop and say that we need to have a rethink about our commitment to the multilateral order and revisit some of these initiatives that I understand are being taken for another motivation, which is about geopolitical concerns. It is about drawing lessons from being less dependent on non-democratic states, particularly on China. So the two, yes, there are, there are legitimate issues. But I think we need, to, we need to rethink about how do we make this more compatible with each other, because if we don't, then we end up in a race to the bottom of the EU reacting to the IRA and having its own subsidy regime, which would also be incompatible with WTO rules, with you know, the voices coming out from the global south on the implications of CBAM, which are very legitimate concerns about how this is going to have a negative impact on the development path of these countries. So... That discussion needs to be had, and I think I, I thank you for both of you for bringing that, you know, to the surface because I think this is inevitable, and this is linked to the third question in my mind, uh, which is even a broader question. Uh, the gentleman uh, uh, alluded to the OECE, but I can even take it further. What is the future of the global security governance now that UN Security Council has become dysfunctional for all practical purposes? I mean, are we back to the Korea War type of, you know, uh, of, uh, of instance where the UN Security Council cannot decide because of this rift between now with Russia, but possibly even going further with China? So how, what happens with our institutions of global governance? And OEC is just one example of that. Having said that, OEC could indeed in the future become the prelude to a renormalization because if you want to re-engage russia i think the the first institution where that can take place would still be the oecd
Right. Thank you very much. Um, fantastic questions, but definitely challenging questions. Um, I'll start a little bit perhaps with the questions about Europe and the rise of the far right, the refugee question, which I think alludes to a sort of Europe in the future, which is a bit of a fortress Europe model. That seems to be um, what is suggesting and what is suggested. Um, and I, I, I agree. No, it's not what it's. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that you're endorsing it. I'm just suggesting that you're preoccupied that this is the direction of travel and absolutely legitimate uh, preoccupations. And I, I agree 100% in interpreting some of the events and some of the trends in Europe in that direction. And yes, the picture is one of contradiction. Um, and I think it's a legitimate question: which of these forces will 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 get? Um, um, will prevail from a political point of view, and I don't have I don't have the crystal ball on this front. Um, but I think the EU has always been, uh, by by definition, uh, a sort of animal of compromise. Um, and I'm already seeing a little bit of compromise. For instance, the far right that is in power, for instance, in Italy, it has all the rhetoric of economic nationalism, but because of constraints, because of the situation of its economy, it has to align with the European mainstream. And I think that's probably the, where we'll see uh, a certain area of compromise, which might be in sort of political ideological terms, it might reflect a convergence between the far right and the, what was the center right, or at least parts of it. And I think, and, uh, and I still think that the risk of a fortress Europe model is there, but it might just be perhaps less extreme than what um, some have um, expected. But I think the fortress model does have huge consequences for how the Europe relates with the rest of the world. And that moves, moves me on to the other uh, questions that were raised. And I think it's interesting that Sinan, and by the way, I, I, I agree very much with your sort of broad analysis of the type of dilemmas that exist between you know, Europe as a multilateral and multilateralist power and as a unilateral and unilateralist power, there are many contradictions and dilemmas there. Um, but I think it's quite interesting that Sinan, the question was, is the US an indispensable partner? And you said, is it an inevitable partner? Which is the word I was looking for, <laughs> because it's not necessarily <laughs> indispensable, but it is inevitable. And I think that really, you know, that that's where the some of the nuance could be. I mean, we see that US-China rivalry is, is leading a sort of trend to split uh, the world in two camps. And I don't think it's in the interest of many countries in Asia. And uh, it's not in the interest of Europe either, of European states. And I think there will be some space for nuance, but that some space of nu for nuance will also be determined by the shape of economic relations to come. And here there's this, all this debate about you know, deglobalization or whether it's you know, more regional patterns. Um, and I think what we might see is some kind of split. You, you know, on the trade of goods, for instance, you continue to have free flow of goods, but on those um, uh, areas which, um, which are deemed of uh, national security interest, then you will have more of a decoupling. Um, but it's, so basically it's gonna be messy rather than a linear. And technology. Yes, exactly, and on technology. And on technology, I think this is where you know, on, on the one hand, Europeans will say we want nuance and we have all these trade relations, export, you know, mark, uh, China is a big export um, country for, for Germany, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but on technology, um, I think Europe has no doubts about where it stands. I mean, we have a uh, US model, which is on technological in innovation based on market-based principles. We have a European model, which is not quite so successful, but it's very much based on top-down regulation. And I think both the US and Europeans are thinking about you know, how successful these models are. But the Chinese model is something that is not of interest for the US, for uh, Europe, and for anyone else, which is techno-surveillance uh, you know, in support of authoritarian regimes. And I think on that front, there's little to be nuanced about. I mean, we, we, we ought to know where we, um, where we stand. The dilemmas between being multilateralist, inclusive, um, uh, and and in dialogue with the rest of the world, I think on the climate front, that's where the that's where the the, the big uh, 
that's where the big diplomatic opportunities are. Um, but where Europe hasn't been very good, I think so far has been a rather unilateral. And I think CBAM is, is one example of that. Um, and that's where uh, I would uh, advocate for a lot more diplomacy on the European front um, and uh, for you know, a different type of yeah, climate diplomacy um, that ought to take place. I think what happened in Sharm el Sheikh when Europeans that with the, decided to support the G77 initiative was one example, but of course it needs to be followed through. But I agree in, in your cr criticism of uh, the way in which Europe uh, presents itself uh, to, the, um, to the rest of the world. And I think it is not just about, and that's where, you know, there's a lot of talk um, in Europe about, in the EU about, you know, engaging with the rest of the world on a partnership basis. And then it's very little is followed through. Um, we see uh, securitization um, of relations. We see an overwhelmingly strong focus on immigration and preventing immigration and partnering with states that are going to act as police persons for Europe. This is what we see, and I think this is hugely problematic. So, I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm with the comments that came, um, but I I'm, I'm just wanted to highlight that these are difficult areas for Europe, precisely because of those, those political trends um, that were taking place. But if, if, if Europe is not able to make those connections between what is happening within Europe and the global picture, in, term, in analytical terms and in strategic terms, then those contradictions are going to continue to be there and continue to be unsolved. Um, and then next vote at the UN, then there might be fewer friends. Um, so it's, uh, and of course this happens at a time when you know, Russia and China have, have doubled down on their international diplomacy um, and on their in, on investments. And, um, you know, but I mean, I'll, my sort of, you know, and, and I, I don't know why sometimes people are quite shocked by me saying it, but ultimately, this is about managing the relative decline of the West um, and, and how to manage it best uh, and how to save what, what works that the West has put in place, but how to make it more inclusive and shared by others as well. Can I just a very short question to Rosa, mm. if I'm allowed? Yeah. Is there any sense of surprise in Brussels about the stance of the global South on Russia, about the lack of, you know, enforcement sanctions and... Is yeah. there a sense of surprise or no? Well, there is actually, yes. It's as if <laughs> this is a major blind spot. Yeah. Um, we put out in June a report called uh, The Southern Mirror. Mm -hmm. um, uh, reflections, yeah. <laughs> reflections from the Global South. And now everybody's calling me, wanting me to present it here and there. <laughs> because the, pers the, the variety of reasons for which the Global South hasn't aligned flatly on the, on the Western's position are simply not understood. And there's a variety of reasons. Um, you know, the, 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 the sort of um, mission that the EU thinks it has taken upon itself to save the world from climate change, and it does not see that it's actually viewed as a hypocritical actor in certain countries. So in Indonesia, it's all about palm, um, or palm tree oil. Um, in, 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 uh, and, and in Brazil, it's, you know, about the Amazon and about the Brazilian sovereignty over the, uh, the Amazon. And, and it's not, you know, right or wrong. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, some of it gets, some of the rhetoric gets manipulated also by political elites in these countries. Uh, but the EU is simply not seeing that um, these debates are taking place elsewhere. And that's on climate. Then, you know, we looked at post-colonialism and, 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 you know, how perceptions of Europe are rooted in, in the colonial experience or the experience with individual countries. Um, uh, we looked at trade, of course, uh, migration and, and security. Um, and all in each of these areas, they're very nuanced mm -hmm. uh, views. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's important that Europeans learn them in order to understand um, the interests of their partners in the global south and try to address them through policies. Muito obrigada. Helena, uh, comentários finais, por favor. Yes, thank you. And um, and I really subscribe to a lot of what has been said by 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 Sinan and by Rosa. 
Uh, by the way, also to recommend uh, Carnegie's report that Rosa just mentioned, uh, among the many who asked for a presentation was the European Parliament and uh, and really uh, very, very interesting report to read. And I confirm that uh, I have not heard the word Global South in as many meetings uh, in, as I have in the past two months in Brussels and elsewhere, actually. I mean, one looks at the various talks at Munich Security Conference. Uh, recently, there was a big think tank event in Brussels, the SEPS Ideas Lab. It's as if everyone is discovering the global south. And 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 to my contribution to answer the same question that I suppose uh, that both Rosa and Sinan have done is that it's actually quite disappointing because 10 years ago or 12 years ago, um, when we were talking about emerging powers and uh, and a lot of what was going on in terms of GDP growth, but also other types of social change uh, and, and and technological change in the countries of the global south, um, the moment was very opportune, I think, for change because, of course, reforming multilateralism to me seems much more possible and give with many more options in a multipolar world, which we could say we had then. Now we're clearly, as Rosa said, in something that looks like an era of messy bipolarity and reforming multilateralism under that kind of geopolitical constellation to me seems very difficult. Uh, so I think there's a big opportunity lost. And I think um, the reaction of the Global South, which does not want to be called Global South, but sort of non-Western uh, countries, to to the war um, now and to, to to and highlighting that for many key principles are non-alignment and and international law uh, is something that is giving giving those countries the voice that they have clearly made clear they have wanted for a while and and there hasn't been the correct response and I think this situation now is making the EU and I would say also the US come back to that realization. And if, if anything, it's a lost opportunity, but perhaps I hope it will not be a second lost opportunity and that there will be some serious discussions under that declaratory, again, words of partnership and, and equal partnership that will go further than just just discussions, but really look at what the fundamental questions behind that are and also how the external implications of internal EU and US policies, again, have on those countries and how diplomacy and other tools can be deployed to support, mitigate those, because if not, we end up with a huge problem, which is as we move towards the green and digital objectives in the developed world, then we will have other major problems to, to, to face in other parts of the world, which, by the way, uh, it has happening in a time of inflation and declining development aid budgets. So these are all very interlinked. It's a it's an algorithm that is hard to crack, but I think a serious discussion should be had. By the way, there is in this month the the Schuman Partnership Forum in Brussels, which is part of the Strategic Compass, and and I and that will be an opportunity where the EU engages with I think over 50 partners on security and defense issues. But it's an opportunity and. And can I also say, because Rosa mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act at some point, I think in a way that has made the EU realize that sometimes pursuing goals that are pursuing the same goals in two different countries can mean that they can have other, I wouldn't call them negative implications, but side effects for partners that have to be taken into consideration. Because what we're seeing at the moment is essentially side effects for the EU of a policy, a green policy that the EU has wanted the US to pursue for a while. So in a way, much of one can see that as a version of what the CBAM or other due diligence and supply chain and deforestation uh, issues, uh, legislation that the EU adopts have on third countries. My final point on the strategic compass, there was a question in which it was said that it should be considered dead in light of the war and um, uh, I, I just want to end by saying I'm of two minds of this. And obviously when you're a think tanker, which at times I still believe I am, the, the tendency is to criticize rather than to appreciate anything that comes out that is a bureaucratic document. But I have to say that there is, I think, value into having a, a concrete sense of what needs to be done that can be reviewed by member states and where member states have agreed to sit down and look at. And, and looking at what it, the deliverables of the strategic compass are, yes, it's nothing like the type of Europe of defense that would face Russia in the current scenario. But next week, 
we're expecting the maritime security strategy later on the space and defense strategy there's a great, there's a lot in there about engaging with partners and i think you know guidelines are important knowing which are the sectors are important and perhaps most most critically there are elements in there to help guide the next multiannual financial framework to putting some type of financing into those initiatives which are not directly military implication initiatives and and we have elections coming up next year in the EU soon thereafter there will be negotiations on where the money should be spent and and it's very hard to spend money without guidance and without uh, a sense of of purpose so i do still think that there is some point in having a document like the strategic compass to be updated and to be criticized and that's the, the great thing about what we do so thank you very much i end <laughs> Obrigada. Fechamos aqui este excelente painel uh, com muitas pistas para a futura reflexão. Muito obrigada aos nossos convidados. Thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm thanking you as well. Ok, Raquel, Sina, Rosa, Helena, thank you very much. Please, can you come to your places?